Tonight on CTV News, the RSA takes its flag debate to Parliament. A local gallery is crying foul over lack of funds. And are house prices easing in Christchurch City? Broadcasting across Canterbury. From the CTV studio, this is First at Five. Good evening, Christchurch's homeless horseman has walked away from court a free man. Richard Hayden has today represented himself in a judge alone trial at the Christchurch District Court after pleading not guilty to a charge of endangering public safety when his horse ran in front of an oncoming car last year. The horse had to be put down as a result of the accident. News Talks of is reporting that the judge says for Mr Hayden to have been proven guilty, the prosecution would have had to prove that the 47-year-old had no control of the horse in the lead up to the accident. He says the arguments put forward were unable to prove that Richard Hayden has been cleared of the charge. To the day's other news now, is it more than just a flag? While well, the Royal New Zealand RSA doesn't want New Zealand's flag changed at all. It's so strong on this topic, it's taking its argument to Parliament. Marcus Gibbs reports. Pat Duggan is a proud New Zealander. The former gunner is staunch on his support for the New Zealand flag and he has a few words for the Prime Minister who's proposing to change it. John Key, I think you've got it a tad wrong, my friend. Over the next few weeks, a Justice and Electoral Select Committee is considering the New Zealand flag referendum spill before reporting back to Parliament this July. A newly appointed committee will choose the design of four alternative flags, from which New Zealanders will choose one. That preference will then be pitted against the existing New Zealand flag in a second referendum. The RSA has been vocal about its opposition to changing the flag, and like many of his fellow veterans, Pat Duggan is offended by the insensitive timing around the two $26 million referendums as the country commemorates the centenary of the First World War. The centenaries over the next four to five years are going to be very, very important for New Zealand and New Zealanders. Uh, and um, to run a, a flag replacement referendum in, in, during that is, is not called for. The flag debate is a contentious issue. Last month a forum was held at Canterbury Museum to discuss proposed designs, but the current flag is very special to New Zealanders, especially the RSA. Returned and service members of the RSA, I think it's very, very important. That is the flag that they took the oath of allegiance under, uh, and it's the flag they fought to, pr to preserve. Pat Duggan served 25 years in the Royal New Zealand Artillery as a gunner from 1962 to 87. He saw combat around the world, including the Vietnam War. Even if the flag is changed, his traditional New Zealand flag will continue to fly high. Uh, when I eventually depart this mortal coil, and hopefully it won't be for a lot longer yet, I'd like my casket to be draped in the current New Zealand flag, nothing else. The RSA isn't alone. Cantabrians are backing its members to keep the flag the way it is today. Yeah, I think it's a, a bit of an insult, to be honest. Well, I think they may have a point because they represent men who have died fighting under that flag. So, But when has the government ever been known for sensitivity? Eh? You know, I'd agree with the RSA. I just like the one the way it is. The flag referendum bill is open for submissions for 10 more days and the RSA is encouraging proud New Zealanders to have their say. I like our flag. And I, it has a link with our past, and um, let's make it a link with our future as well. It, it's, it's a damn fine emblem. The RSA hopes the debate will be put on hold until after the commemorations of Armistice Day 2018. But even then, will the New Zealand flag remain the same, or will New Zealanders vote to change it? Time will tell. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. Well, art has so far been a major casualty in the post-quake budgets and one out gallery is still after funds. It needs another $100,000 before it can reopen. Tanya Green has this story. Another day, another rebuild roadblock. This local art gallery on Gloucester Street, the centre of contemporary art, also known as Coca, has been closed since 2011 after being badly damaged in the earthquakes. It was built back in 1968, a modern structure in its time, but when the February 2011 quake hit, they thought they got off easy, but more damage surfaced. It wasn't until we had detailed engineering assessments that it became quite clear that structurally the building did need quite a lot of upgrading, would need a lot of work. COCA was insured, receiving a payout of nearly $3 million with the help from Christchurch City Council and private contributors who have all pitched in to help for the repairs. But it's slowly being rebuilt back to life, but not without a final battle to finish it off. They're still $100,000 short. We have got money in reserve and if required we will 
dip into that and then fundraise retrospectively to recoup those funds. But we're, we're committed to opening in spring this year and we'll make that happen. They took the rebuild as an opportunity to use modern ideas like lining the walls with ply to make artworks easier for hanging. However, with the extra expense, the gallery is looking into ways they can cover the shortfall, even if that means selling off some old art, once hired out to businesses around Christchurch. But she says this is just one of many options. That is one thing we're currently looking at, is the future of that um, collection, whether we keep it and continue to hire it out, or whether we sell it and reinvest the funds in other, way, other ways. It's really just which is the most financially viable option for us. She says it's likely the art would go to private buyers, but they're not making any final decisions yet. Walking around, the whole interior has been stripped out and completely reconstructed, making way for a 21st century gallery, adding to a modern feel for art around the city. The gallery has invested extra money into doubling the building's earthquake code to the new required standard. But she says she can't wait for galleries like this opening back up to local Cantabrians. It's a really exciting time for art in Christchurch. I think we've all been starved of art in the city. We haven't had a public gallery open and with COCA and the Christchurch Art Gallery opening in the next few months, um, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's overdue and I think um, the public will be delighted by what they see. If they can get the money together and everything is on track, they'll be opening the doors ready for their October reopening. Tanya Green, CTV News. Well, the city's house prices continue to rise, but there seems to be more stock coming onto the market. But is it enough to ease prices? Has the city's housing stock returned? One of the city's biggest real estate agents says properties for sale on its books have increased nearly 30% compared to the same time last year. This compares to all other centres around New Zealand, where there are fewer properties on the company's sale books compared to last year. The average house sold by Harcourts in Christchurch now goes for more than $523,000. This is a 3% increase on March 2014. The company says the increase is because buyers are now prepared to pay premium prices for properties. But with more housing stock coming on the market and the impending winter cooling off buyer interest, Harcourt says investors are now likely to look longer term at property options, including the city CBD. Well, still to come here on CTV News, more crusaders take up contracts overseas. When you need to know what's happening in your region of Canterbury, join me, Chris Lynch, for CTV News First at Five, weeknights from five, right here on your local channel, CTV. Computer not working? Replace or repair? DIY or get a technician? Looking for parts? Thinking of upgrading? Need accessories? You've got questions, we've got answers. Global PC. The preparation. The devotion. The fearlessness. The intensity. Runway model management. First impressions are everything. Sinclair and the team at Gone Fishing as they bring you great stories, fishing tips and beautiful scenery. Gone Fishing, Friday night at 8.30, right here on CTV.
Welcome back to CTV News. Another All Blacks player is ditching New Zealand for greener and more lucrative pastures. This time it's our youngest talent heading to Europe. Gordon Finlater explains. It was recently announced that All Black utility back Charles Piatau would be joining Irish club Ulster post the Rugby World Cup. It's not unusual for All Black players to chase overseas opportunities towards the end of their careers, but at just 23, Piatau's decision came as a shock, and with big money being offered, it could soon become the norm for players in their prime to ditch New Zealand rugby. Crusaders coach Todd Blackadder weighed in on the conversation at his side's training last week. It just seems to be the new norm, isn't it? You know, where you know you get a lot of guys, you develop them through, they take their opportunity, they're just on the cusp of being in the All Blacks and they've been in there and they're about to nail it. And and then obviously, you know, um, yeah, you can see that these foreign clubs too, they're targeting those guys. They know that they've got a, you know, if they can get them for big money now, they probably get another five years out of them. Whereas, you know, the old traditional thinking was that they'd go at the end of their career after giving everything back to New Zealand rugby, but it's no longer the case, so you know, everyone has their price, I suppose. The latest player finding himself with a big decision to make is Crusaders' first five and fullback, Colin Slade, who will reportedly be offered $720,000 a year if he signs with French club Payu, or Payu rather, after the World Cup. With both Dan Carter and Tom Taylor committing their futures to European clubs at the end of the year, the breeding ground of All Black first fives in recent times could find themselves scraping the bottom of the barrel. Oh, I just think this lady, you know, it's, um, you know, he's got a lot tough in New Zealand rugby. I don't think anyone here wants to see him go. I'm sure the All Blacks don't either, but you know, for him it's, it's got to be his own decision. Like We all have different motivations at different points of our career I suppose and everyone has their price I suppose you know it's like some of the money being bandied around if that's the case is just ridiculous isn't it I mean it just makes it so that you can't compete here in New Zealand um, and it just really comes down to whether the guys still want to play in the All Blacks or not. With European clubs having such a strong financial pull New Zealand rugby may find themselves regularly being outbid on top talents. Well, one of the challenges that we have around, you know, we've got so many experienced players here, is that they eat up you know, three quarters of the of the um, salary cap, and then you, you've got a whole, you know, you've got you know, 18 or 20 young guys that you want to retain, and we just uh, can't compete. So we've basically got to just have a wee rethink about, a, you know, a rejig about how we go about it. Gordon Findlater, CTV Sport. Well, how do you keep the children and parents for that matter entertained during these school holidays? Well, that's been the one goal of a Selwyn resident who believes they've achieved just that. Lego, Lego and more Lego. A rainbow of colours scattered the floor, keeping these children busy constructing, well, whatever their imagination desires. Around 70 kids and parents turned up to the fun day at the Rolleston Community Centre, set up by one enthusiastic Lego fan for the Selwyn district. I actually think I've got the best job out there. <laughs> There's around 80,000 pieces of the colourful plastic bricks for these cheerful kids to choose from, worth in value of around $6,000. She's been doing this for the last three school holidays, but there was an interesting start to this idea. A year ago, Rachel finished up as a child carer, becoming very unwell and unable to work for six weeks. So she decided to come up with something unique, a project designed to achieve a lifelong commitment to her husband, Jason, who also dreamed from a young age of working at the company's headquarters. I was told when we got married that he wants, he's always since he was five wanted to work for Lego. So sitting there for six weeks I tried to think about how I could make this happen um, without going overseas to Lego but bringing a Lego business to our family. So. And from there she created this, all from a large collection they own and nearly every piece has been bought from their own pockets. This is all ours, um, pretty much put our lifetime savings into this um, but it's been worth it just to see the fun with the kids and no. It's, it's great. This is the second brick building fun day, seeing these children put together their creations, everything from a Grand Designs lifestyle block or maybe two ships in one. But she says it's an activity for the families around the area to enjoy. It's just designed to give an air place for the parents to relax because they can just sit down and watch the kids playing with the Lego. Um, and so it's a three hour event and a lot of people arrive sort of when we're opening and they stay for the full three hours. And one of the parents says it's a great way to keep his kids happy over the school holiday period. 
everybody's got kids at home trying to figure out what to do, how to keep them busy. So it's really nice to just be able to come to a place like this and just let them let them go for gold. We've exposed them, you know, to TV and video games and stuff. And um, but it's really great. There's something timeless about Lego, and there's something timeless about just putting blocks together and building things. So it's really good for my boys because they, you know, it, it helps them express their creativity and things like that. And his son Josiah showed me what he created. See it. That's the sea, yep. and boats go on it, and that's pipes going up pens and, and, and the sea. But Nathan says parents get something out of it too. Apparently there's a coffee cart coming, which keeps most parents happy. And yeah, yeah. This won't be the last fun day, with Rachel saying the event will be back in July. And although it's fun for children, it's also fun for adults as well. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. Very nice. Well, it was an organisation formed to fight for women's rights in New Zealand. And on this day, nearly 120 years ago, the National Council of Women was formed here in Christchurch. On this day 119 years ago, prominent suffragette Kate Shepherd became the first president of the National Council of Women in Christchurch. A convention of 11 women's groups met to create the council with an aim of improving women's rights. New Zealand women have become the first in the world to gain the right to vote three years earlier, but council members thought more work needed to be done with equal pay, equal rights in marriage and divorce, and a host of other social change policies. After World War I, the council refocused on temperance initiatives. As more women had joined the workforce, had obtained higher education, had fewer marriages, and there were high death rates in childbirth. Today, the Council is an umbrella organisation of 280 other lobbying groups. Based in Wellington, it has 21 branches nationwide and with volunteer help continues the work it started in Christchurch since 1896. We'll work out the maths on that in a moment. We'll still to come here on CDV News, the weekend sports roundup and your region's weather. right here on CTV. Tune in every Saturday from 7am to 8am for an exciting range of fantastic kids programming. Join in with all the fun Saturday mornings from 7am to 8am on CTV. At Bowden Environmental, we specialise in all aspects of resource management so you don't have to deal with the paperwork. With the skills and knowledge to organise any environmental work, we can guide you through the process from start to finish. From organising consents and farm environmental plans to pump and well testing, Bowden Environmental has it covered. Save time and remove the stress. See the specialist. Bowden Environmental. Computer not working? Replace or repair? DIY or get a technician? Looking for parts? Thinking of upgrading? Need accessories? You've got questions, we've got answers. Global PC. Come on down to Fairy Mead Golf. Care for a game of paintball? How about some swings on the old driving range? Or on our par 3 9 hole golf course? Test your skills on the mini golf course or have a go at the air gun shooting range. Then relax at the Whale Cafe with one of our super succulent Whale Burgers. Whether you want to perfect your swing or are looking for a fun family day out, come down to Ferrymead Golf, 50 Ferrymead Park Drive, right next to the Ferrymead Heritage Park. Arts 21 showcases the vast creative talent and minds that are making a name for themselves in Europe and beyond. Think outside the square with Arts 21. And welcome back to CDV News. Now here's Gordon with the Weekend Sports Roundup. Pressure is back on the Crusaders after the side went down to the Highlanders in their southern derby match at AMI Stadium. 
Saturday night's match got off to a frantic start with the Highlanders taking an early three-point lead before the Crusaders kicked into gear with Colin Slade making a bursting run before Nemani Nandolo set up Matt Todd with a majestic offload. The Highlanders found themselves down a man after the try with Lima Sopoanga binned for a late shoulder on Colin Slade. The Sinbin period brought reward for the home side who took advantage of the extra man with Jordan Tafua running over the line after some battering ram action from Nandolo. With the Crusaders leading 14 points to 6 just before the break, things quickly turned with a try to Ben Smith on half-time, leaving the visitors just one point behind. The start of the second was all the Highlanders, with two tries in the space of 10 minutes, handing them a healthy advantage. Two penalty conversions from Colin Slade gave the Crusaders a late chance to take the game. However, the Highlanders held on for the win and the four points with the final score, 25 points to 20. Well, the mainland tactics couldn't upset the odds last night as they went down to top of the table West Coast fever in Blenheim. The tactics went some way to restoring their reputation after their record loss to the Steel a fortnight ago. The match's third quarter saw the Fever take the match away, winning the quarter by five goals to go into the final quarter with an 11-point advantage. Errors are still the main issue for the side, who again look to struggle to find penetration in the final third. The brightest note for the side was once again Malawi shooter Maui Kumwenda, who shot an impressive 34 from 36 for her side. The Canterbury Rams made a statement on Friday night, racking up their second win in three games in this year's National Basketball League. The side are now two from two at Cal Stadium after knocking off the much-fancied Southland Sharks 94-92. Trailing by eight going into the final quarter, the Rams rallied in the final stages of the match with captain Ethan Rusbatch shooting an impressive five from five from three-point range in his 20-point performance, while Ford Richie Edwards continued his great start to the season notching 21 points, his third straight 20-plus point performance. And finally tonight, Hornby and Burnside were the big winners at the weekend's Canterbury Champion of Champions Bowls triples held at Papua Nui. The Blackjacks pairing of Mandy and Emily Boyd, along with Emily Miller, took out the women's title in a nail-biter. The Papua Nui team led by one going into the final end, with the Burnside triple winning the final end by two to take the title 17-16. The men's title went the way of Hornby, with Trevor Kennett, Graham Weeds and Grant Adams holding a steady lead throughout, eventually taking their final against Elmwood 17-15. You're up to date with the latest in local sport. I'm Gordon Finlater for CTV Sport. Well, winter has arrived in the deep south. Will the snow hit Christchurch? Let's take a look at your weather forecast. Good evening, Canterbury. A very cool day out there today. Hopefully you wrapped up warm. Let's check out today's temperatures. Tamuka, Timaru and Geraldine, 11 degrees. Ashburn and the Methvin, you're on a high of 11 today. Rakai, 11 for you. Darfield, Leeston and Rolleston, you all shared 11 degrees today. As for Lincoln and Christchurch, 11. Over in Akara, a very cold day for you. Hopefully you wrapped up warm, sitting on 11. As for Kaiapoi, Rangiola and Avli, you guys were slightly warmer, just on 12. Colverdon, Hamner Springs and Cheviot, a very similar picture for you on 12. Kaikoura, 12 degrees for you. 
taking a look at tomorrow's weather now. Tomorrow, the early showers will clear and some strong cold southwesterly winds will start easing later on in the day. Your overnight low tonight is 3. Tomorrow's high, 11 degrees. Bluebirds fly And the dreams that you dream Ash Burton tomorrow will be mostly cloudy and very cold with a southwesterly breeze. Your overnight low is 3. Tomorrow's high, 11 degrees. Someday you wish upon a star Wake up where the clouds are far behind Taking a look at Christchurch now, there'll be some showers at first, but they will disappear during the morning, but the cloud will stay on. It'll be very chilly and some strong southwesterly breezes. Your overnight low is three. Tomorrow's high, 10 degrees. And quite colder tomorrow, there'll be some morning showers, but they'll clear, leaving you with a cloudy day, which will be very cold with some strong southwesterly winds. Make sure you wrap up warm. Tonight's low is three. Tomorrow's high, ten degrees. Taking a look at the other areas around the region now, it'll be very cold too, with Tamuka and Geraldine having some cloud, twelve degrees. Methven and Rakai, cloudy for you also, slightly cooler on eleven. Darfield, Leeston, Rolleston and Lincoln, you all share the cloudy weather tomorrow and it will be cold, wrap up warm, 11 degrees. Over in Akaroa tomorrow, cloudy for you all day, expect 10 degrees. Further north, Kaiapoi, Rangiola and Ambly, also a very cloudy day for you on 11. Way up high. <sighs> Culverton, Hamner Springs and Cheviot expect those cloudy patches all day tomorrow on 10 degrees. Looking ahead for Canterbury now, there'll be a period of cloud on Wednesday, then it'll become fine and sunny later on in the day, but expect some strong and very cold southwesterly winds. As for Thursday, be mostly fine and sunny with some moderate southwesterly winds and northeasterlies later on. It'll be much milder on Friday with some sunny periods here and there and high cloud and moderate northerly winds. As for Saturday, morning clouded first, but then it will turn out fine and sunny with some cool southwesterly winds dying out later on. And Sunday, fine view with some high cloud increasing and moderate northeasterlies. And that is your weather for Monday. Oh, there we go. Well, uh, that is CDF News for Monday. We leave you with some aerial footage now of the closed Evans Pass Road linking Sumner and Littleton. Have a great evening. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.